As interest rates rise, volatility has hit equities hard. How should investors think about equity investing amid high inflation and slowing economic growth? Here's what matters. Live from New York City, I'm Lauren Goodwin, and this is Market Matters from New York Life Investments. In this podcast, we bring you the best insights from across the New York Life Investments platform because we believe that by sharing perspectives and engaging with you, our listeners, we can all become better investors. Welcome, everybody. It's the week of August 1st, 2022, and today we're kicking off what's going to be a fabulous month on Market Matters. We'll be digging into all things equity, real estate, infrastructure, value versus growth, you name it. And to help us do that, we've invited four portfolio managers from across the New York Life Investments platform to leverage their expertise and their approach to equity investing in this time of market tumult and rising rates. We are kicking things off this month with a look at equity investments in real estate. And we are so pleased to welcome John Miniman, a global portfolio manager at CBRE Investment Management. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you both for having me. John, kicking us off here, when most people think about real estate, they think about their home. But what does real estate mean to you? What's your investment universe look like? Yep. So we're, we're investing in REITs or listed real estate. So these are publicly traded companies that own portfolios of commercial real estate. They're all for rent. There's no for sale. So we don't own home builders. Um, think about sectors like industrial or residential or office or retail. Um, and what's interesting is how the universe has changed over the last 20 years. Historically, it was very heavily skewed towards sectors like office or retail where, as we define it, the growth sectors have really grown in importance. So think residential, that's apartments, manufactured housing, single family for rent, industrial, storage, some of the technology sectors that didn't exist 20 years ago. So towers and data centers. So it really is a very well diversified subset of of the real estate sector. And, And over time, the universe does trade like private real estate. They are equities. They get marked to market on a daily basis. But over time, the return and risk looks very much like the private real estate universe. You know, you mentioned that real estate has changed a lot over the last 20 years, which is no doubt true. I mean, in that amount of time, we've had the surge in the internet of, of all things. But the industry has also changed a lot in the last just two years since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. How did the pandemic change commercial real estate in your perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so what I would say is it's, it accelerated trends that were already in place. So obviously accelerated the adoption of e-commerce. But what's interesting is um, you saw an expansion of buy now, pick up and store, kind of, kind of the omni-channel aspect where you're ordering online, but you're actually using the physical store as a delivery method. So in certain instances or a lot of instances, it's actually benefited physical real estate. Um, it's increased data usage. So data centers and, and cell towers saw very strong demand. And where it's, it's had a, an acceleration in the long-term impact are sectors like office, where office, you know, in general has been a relatively challenged sector, but in a world of work from home, a hybrid environment, what does that mean for future office demand? Our view is it's going to mean less space over time. You know, CBRE has done a study that they believe somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 percent less office space will be needed over time. So it's it's magnifying trends that were already in place pre-COVID. That is such an interesting overview of, you know, how the pandemic has altered this space on a very holistic level. And as we're moving on from that pandemic era, we know that there has been a lot of market and macroeconomic tumult that has accompanied. Obviously, inflation is top of mind for investors, rising interest rates, volatility. Let's drill down for a second on how you would say those macro factors have been impacting real estate fundamentals and the performance of those stocks on the listed markets. Why don't we start with the big one, um, given that the Fed is still aggressively tightening policy? What is the impact on listed real estate from higher interest rates? Yep, another, another great question. So if you go back over time, 
over the long time, there is very lo low correlation between the listed real estate sector and interest rates. But what you find is when you get these sharp upward move in interest rates, it creates a lot of volatility. It creates a lot of angst for the asset class. And it's really the market is trying to figure out in an environment of higher rates, is there an offset to higher growth? So if growth can more than offset the higher interest rates, the asset class trades, trades fine. That's where the market sits today. Again, it's this push pull of fundamentals for real estate are actually really strong. You know, our numbers, our, our estimates of earnings have actually doubled year to date relative to where we were at, at, at the end of the year. But right now, the market is trying to say, are rates moving faster than the fundamentals? And if the answer is yes, what does that mean from a pricing perspective? And, you know, we acknowledge that we think there is somewhere on the order of a five to 10 percent decline in real estate values that is occurring but we think the listed markets have way overshot that. You know, we, we're sitting at about a 25% discount to our estimate of net asset value. So what do we think the real estate is worth relative to where the stocks are trading today? So not only is the market priced it in, it's way more than priced in where we think the, the actual impact of the higher rates are going to be. That's a really interesting word to use, uh, overshooting in terms of the reaction of this asset class to this rising interest rate environment. And we could probably argue that that's been the case across other asset classes as well. When it comes to real estate, though, linking a few of the ideas that you just mentioned, we know that inflation is kind of the common thread across all of this. Why do people say that real estate is a good inflation hedge? Yep. So again, going back historically, and when we've been in periods of above average inflation, the listed real estate sector has outperformed broad equity. So history says it does quite well when, when inflation is high. Th there's a couple of reasons for that is one, real estate are hard assets, right? So in an inflationary environment, the cost to replace those assets are going up. CBRE put out a note last, last week that said construction costs were up 14% on a trailing 12 month basis. So to build those assets, it's gotten 14 to 15% more expensive. So your assets are going up in value and generally your, your liabilities are fixed. Secondarily, and, and, and truthfully more important is pricing power. So the sectors that have short lease durations, so think hotels, one night lease, residential, generally a 12 monthly storage, shorter term leases, they have the ability to reprice those leases quickly to offset inflation and offset um, you know, higher expenses. So they have pricing power. You know, a, a great example of that is in you know, the CPI print that we got today and, and we've gotten over the last couple of months. One of the strongest factors within is the rent piece. You know, rent is, a, is about a third of the CPI. Rents are at all time highs. We're undersupplying housing. So the, the retail, the, sorry, the residential landlords have incredible pricing power. Occupancies are 97, 98%. People need somewhere to live. And if you're going to stay in place, you know, in certain markets, you're getting hit with 10 to 15% rent increases. So again, it's that ability to, to, put, to pass along that inflation uh, in, in relatively short order. Pricing power is so important in an environment like this. And, and what I'm hearing is that um, in, in some ways, real estate assets can help to build resilience against the inflation impact that we're seeing across assets, across the economy, across portfolios. I think the, the next macro transition uh, would then be concern about recession. Um, many investors are concerned that the factors we've already discussed, like inflation and a hawkish Fed, are, are likely to cause a recession moving forward. How are REITs or real estate investment trust positions in the event that recession does happen? It, it's a really important question. And again, I think that's a little bit of the frustration we have felt here today where listed real estate is down as much as, as, as the S&P 500. And again, we think because of that embedded lease structure, the earnings are going to be significantly more stable. But if you go back over time, you know, the modern REIT era really started in the mid 90s. So there, there's been three recessionary periods in that modern REIT era. There was the tech bubble, there was the global financial crisis, and there was COVID. Whatever this is going to be, it's going to be very different from the last two. And I think you know, the market's muscle memory is, has a recency bias. So they think about COVID, they think about the global financial crisis. 
One was a capital markets crisis. One was a health crisis where the government basically said your assets can't be open. This is going to be inflation slash consumer led. So this is going to be very, very different. And, you know, if you go back to the tech bubble, REITs actually materially outperformed broad equities in that period. But I, but I think what's really important is this REIT sector is in such better shape than they were prior to COVID and prior to the global financial crisis. So what do I mean by that? Valuation. We're trading it at, at a near 25% discount, the underlying, the underlying asset value. Interest coverage is two times what it was prior to the global financial crisis significant lease term and balance sheet. So there's no near-term debt maturities to the extent rates continue to increase. Very low floating rate debt. And then finally, very low dividend payout ratios relative to history. So we think even if growth slows, we're still going to see dividend growth increase at least in line with earnings um, in the 2023. It's very insightful. And, and one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in this conversation is risks that we frankly can't control the Fed, inflation, recession. And you're describing some of the things that portfolio managers can control. Um, what about underwriting? What what are you um, what are you doing in your own portfolios from an underwriting perspective to address this more challenging macro environment? Good, good question again. So, you know, we, we have a deep resource team. We have analysts that are underwriting each of the companies in our, in our buy list. We have an earnings model. We have a net asset value model. And over the last few weeks, you know, we've definitely gotten more conservative in our underwriting. We're not underwriting a full-blown recession, but we are underwriting conservatism. So what does that mean? Higher interest rates, more aggressive Fed, wider borrowing spreads um, in, in the fixed income market less external growth. So 2021, because REITs traded so well, they had a very advantaged cost of capital. They did a lot of external growth that's driving a lot of the earnings growth this year. We've backed that off given you know, the stocks have traded a, a little bit um, more, more poorly this year. Um, and then generally just been more conservative in the underwriting, um, you know, a little bit of backup and occupancy, a little less uh, strength in, in rent spreads, but even in that environment, you know, we, we still see a market that should deliver north of 10% earnings growth in, in 2022 and, and mid single digits in, in 2023, which should stack up really attractively relative to the S&P 500, where you, know, you, you hear on a daily basis that is the market cheap, is the market cheap? Nobody knows what the E is going to be next year. And, and we're now starting to enter a cycle for, for the S&P where earnings are being revised lower. It's a question of how much does earnings, how far do earnings get revised lower? But for listed real estate, because of that embedded lease structure, we think the earnings are going to be significantly more stable than what you're going to see out of the S&P 500. John, let me pivot us a little bit to the performance aspect of this. And we've touched on this at a few points over this conversation, namely how real estate can provide some angles of resilience in this macro environment, but also how the asset class has overshot a little bit in terms of its reaction uh, to the general market tumult. Can you tell us a little bit about how REITs have performed over time versus how they're performing year to date? Absolutely. So over the last 20 years, REITs have returned just shy of 20, uh, just shy of 10% per annum. And if you look back historically, about a third to a half of that has be, been from the dividend component. You know, REITs typically pay, you know, above average dividend yield. When you look year to date, really through June 30th, they're down as much as, as the S&P 500 is. So down about 20%, which again, to us, creates the opportunity. We, we touched on it earlier we believe the asset class is trading at near a 25% discount to its underlying asset value. Um, that's about the widest it's been outside of the global financial crisis and outside of COVID. Historically, U.S. REITs trade in a band of about plus or minus 15% premium or discount to NAV. So we're, we're at pretty extreme levels. And that discount is on more conservative underwriting. So again, when we look at it relative to where they the, the underlying real estate is worth today, there's a material, material discount. 
Just one more big picture question here, John. There's been a lot of talk among the investors that that we speak to about the wall of private equity capital sitting on the sidelines, this concept of dry powder, that there's lots of cash ready to be utilized in the sector and that that can put pressure on opportunities. Uh, What does that mean to you? Are there any implications for the real estate sector from your perspective? Yeah, another great question. So if you go back to an earlier comment I made about where do we think declines in values can go, I had mentioned kind of on the order of 5 to 10%. And one of the reasons that we think the declines will be limited to that is because of this wall of capital. So there's about $300 billion that reside with, with private equity funds that have been earmarked to be allocated to real estate. Uh, that's 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 a levered number, um, but but it's it's a significant amount of capital that needs to find a home. They're not giving that money back. This capital resides in the likes of Blackstone, Brookfield, KKR, Aries, et cetera. Um, and given the scale of some of these platforms, they need very large portfolios of assets. You know, it takes a long time buying fifteen twenty million dollar assets to put out some of the capital that has been raised. So we think that's going to be incredibly supportive of that, uh, supportive of values. We're in a period now where, because of the rate volatility, we just need stability. People need to under, under, be able to underwrite where are rates going, where are spreads going, to then get back to the transaction markets. And, and to your question about where does that potentially create opportunities, we've seen the likes of Blackstone privatize four company, four listed companies in the last six months. So they've taken companies that are, are in the stock market that we have owned, some of them, and paid large premiums to, to, to buy those assets. Um, we think that will continue over time. We think that creates an opportunity, especially with the group trading at the discount it is. And, and there's an ironic aspect where you know, these private REITs have raised a whole lot of capital but to the end investor, they're effectively buying those assets at 100 cents on the dollar, where in the public markets today, given the discounts, you can buy those same assets at 75 cents on the dollar. So again, that, that, that really creates the opportunity in the public markets, um, given where that discount resides. And, and as an active manager, you know, historically, we've done a really nice job of identifying some of those M&A targets that, that have been taken private by some of the names that we had mentioned. That's an excellent time to start our portfolio pause, a segment of the program where we share investment ideas. And John, I want to start by following up on what you were just discussing in terms of uh, changing changes in positioning and opportunities. How have all of these macro factors uh, impacted your positioning? So we, you know, we we have definitely gotten more conservatively positioned within the portfolio. The the sectors that that we put in our our cyclical bucket sectors like retail and office, we we have an underweight too. We've magnified that underweight. But also the volatility has created opportunities to kind of reinforce um, attractive investments in sectors that we think have been unfairly beaten up. So some of the growthier sectors where we have the highest conviction in the trajectory of earnings, residential, industrial, storage, you know, the, the volatility has, has pushed some of those sectors to, you know, really discounts that we've not seen in a number of years. Part of it was they performed really well in 2021, but that creates the opportunity. That creates the opportunity to push more capital into those sectors where there's a high level of conviction about the growth they're going to deliver. And, you know, a lot of that is funded with, um, you know, some of those more cyclical sectors that we think are going to be challenged over the next six to 12 months, given the macro environment. John, that's that's a fascinating response, and I think it feeds in directly to to what I wanted to follow up with, which is about the active versus passive management argument. When it comes to REITs in particular, what would you say is the main benefit of active management or the main drivers of success there versus passive? Yeah, so real, listed real estate is one of the few sectors over time where active managers have consistently outperformed their respective benchmark. And I think you know, a big portion of that is real estate is, is a unique asset class. 85% of, of the real estate market 
is, is still held in private hands. Only 15% is in public markets. And I think that's where being part of a large real estate platform really lends an edge to underwriting asset values, underwriting fundamentals. Um, you know, we think we can add value from both a top down and a bottom up perspective. So top down being kind of what sectors do you want to allocate capital to? Historically, that's been about a third of, of the outperformance. And then the balance being, again, that, that bottom up underwriting where our investment team spends the vast majority of the time is making sure we're underwriting the companies better than consensus. We're kind of looking around the corner to see where do we think numbers are going to be better than consensus, where we think numbers are going to be worse than consensus. Um, and again, because it's such a specific sector, um, you know, we think we have a real underwriting edge, especially in, in periods of, of real macro uncertainty where, you know, the, the underlying fundamentals are inflecting. And you got to go back to 08, 09, 2020, 2021, global financial crisis, and then COVID and coming out of COVID. You know, that's historically as an active manager where we've added uh, the, the most alpha, the, the most outperformance versus a benchmark. And finally, how would you encourage people to use real estate in the context of a diversified, you know, multi-asset portfolio? A lot of our listeners will be thinking about this asset class within their more broad allocation and their broader exposure. Yeah, another another great question. So we think about it two different ways. I mean, one is 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 a strategic allocation that that may enhance total return, current income, portfolio diversification. If you think about listed real estate, rather the, the S&P 500, listed real estate represents less than 3% of that index. So we think over time, having a, a, an allocation of 5 to 10% can really help from a portfolio diversification perspective. The, the, other, the other way to think about it is you know, enhancing a, an income-focused strategy or an inflation hedging strategy. We talked a little bit about the income component, the income component growth over time, and then why we think the asset class is an inflation hitch. Um, and, and may also be a strong complement uh, to someone's private real estate allocation. You know, we, we talked about that over time, there is a real convergence to how listed real estate performs from a return and risk perspective relative to the private market real estate. You get there over time, but in, but in the interim period, like we're in today, the public markets create opportunities to, to allocate to the sector at a significant discount to where values are in the, in the private market. John, you've been incredibly generous with your insights today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both for the opportunity. Coming up next, we continue to speak to equity portfolio managers across the New York Life Investments platform. We'll be speaking with Wellington Management to discuss opportunities in value investing. But that's it for today. We'll be back next week for more Market Matters. In the meantime, please remember to give us a like, follow, or review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a question or topic of interest, maybe a portfolio manager you want to hear from, reach out to us on LinkedIn. You can also follow our views at newyorklifeinvestments.com and click the Insights tab. Until then, I'm Lauren Goodwin. And I'm Julia Herman. See you next time.